So, Ms. Selich, it's kind of amazing that between the two of us, we have seven kids. That's a lot. You know, I read somewhere that a baby goes through about 2,000 diapers in their first year. So that means we've gone through close to 14,000 diapers. Yeah, imagine if the government was giving out (laughs) diapers to help families. That would actually be helpful, right? I could see it now. The Department of Health and Human Diapers, DHHD. What would be crazy is if you're a rich family that can afford all those diapers, that you would actually get more than maybe for a poorer family. Right. And if there's a family that can't afford as many diapers, the government will give you fewer diapers. Yeah. It makes you wonder if this so-called government diapers department really understands the idea of assistance. Mm. Yeah. That's the essence of the current child tax credit bill. From First Focus on Children, this is Speaking of Kids. I'm Bruce Leslie. And I'm Masella Chlubi. Speaking of Kids is a podcast that puts kids at the center of public policy. So diapers aside, that is the inherent absurdity of the child tax credit assistance as it currently stands. Exactly. And, you know, Bruce, how, how did we get here? Well, every other nation in the developed world, or among wealthy nations, I guess, has a child allowance. And in the United States, it was recommended in 1991 that we have a child allowance. The National Commission on Children made such a recommendation. But unfortunately, in 1997, when the child tax credit was created, the Speaker of the House was Newt Gingrich. And as they were negotiating With President Bill Clinton, they decided to make it such that it was only based upon your income. And so therefore, poor families were actually left behind. Mm, Yeah. And so here we are 27 years later, and we're still trying to get all children to get the same amount of funding and so that we don't leave millions of kids behind because of the very fact that their, their families make too little income. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, we all know that giving birth and creating families is is such a precarious time that I think oftentimes gets not enough attention. You know, I know in my case with my second, after delivering him, you know, he was in the NICU for about three and a half weeks. So we all know that we can make a plan for childbirth or we can make a plan to save money, but things pivot real time. And you may end up in a situation where you know, in your case, Bruce, you you had twins. Um, and that's not something that you always plan for, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's exactly right. And it's amazing, right? Because it's a wonderful, wonderful experience. But for many, many reasons, as you noted, is you go in and out of the workforce or uh, mom might need to go on bed rest or we know lots of complications that develop. I mean, we have a crazy, awful maternal and infant mortality rates in this country. But that also means there's a lot of kids and moms who, you know, have complications. And so you go out of the workforce during pregnancy, you have labor, and then you have this whole postpartum period that there's also things. And as a nation, we don't have family medical leave. We don't provide child care. So there's no wonder that families have less income at that very time. And yet they have more expenses because they now have a baby. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, between hospital bills, I mean, starting from, you know, even prenatal visits, right? I mean, that can get costly, like you said, if you need to go on bed rest. And then the hospital bills that you get for the actual delivery, postpartum visits for you and your child, you know, for some families that may mean figuring out transportation, figuring out childcare for their other kids. I mean, there is beauty in in this phase, but there is also a level of stress and definitely financial stress that comes with this that oftentimes gets unrecognized and is not always the same. There's a window where things really get exacerbated within that prenatal to first year of life that really families need more support in that window. Yeah. It's horribly unfortunate that we're shortchanging children at the very moment where those investments have the biggest bang for their buck. And we know that kids born into and raised in poverty have far worse outcomes in every aspect of their lives, right? They have worse education attainment. They have worse health care. There's more child hunger and homelessness. We know that, for example, in the first year of life, babies are the population most often evicted from housing and Um, It's also the period of time when 
they are most likely to go into the child welfare system. So we should be providing more supports, not fewer. And that's the inherent problem with the way the policy works now. You know, Bruce, you're spot on. And I think the thing that makes me the most frustrated is right now we're still looking at and fighting for equality, right? For all families to get the same amount per child. But really, we haven't even scratched the surface on equity. Like for a lot of these families, you know, we should really explore what it might look like to really drive at true equity. Low income kids need more support, not less. We're far from doing the right thing for kids. Today, we have two guests who deeply care about children and families getting out of the cycle of poverty and thriving. They help us unpack the reasons why CTC is necessary in our country and the finer points of where contradictions place a burden on families. Sophie Collier is a research director at the Center on Poverty and Social Policy at Columbia University. She also evaluates anti-poverty policies at the national and local level with a particular interest in tax policies such as the child tax credit. And Megan Curran is the director of policy at the Center on Poverty and Social Policy at Columbia University. She is particularly interested in the child tax credit and how the structure and impact of child allowance programs in other countries might inform the creation of a national child allowance in the United States. And Megan is a former First Focus on Children staff person, and we love her and miss her dearly. So it's really great to have her on today. A real treat. Welcome to Speaking of Kids, Megan and Sophie. Yes, Megan and Sophie, thank you so much again for joining us. You too. (laughs) This is great. All right, so let's get started. Columbia University's Center on Poverty and Social Policy does incredible work on policy research. I am very grateful to have both of your beautiful, bright minds working on these important issues because you could have been doing anything and you're working on solving some of the most complex issues of our time. So to try to get a little bit into the meat of our conversation today, why is it so important to try and lift children out of poverty? Megan, we can start with you and then go over to Sophie. Yeah, we can come at this from a couple of different angles. And first and foremost, you know, there's a real moral angle to this. We know that a lot of this is the product of like how we've structured our system, but this is a very solvable like thing in that like there are policy choices that we can make that either sort of make it better for families, make it easier, or make it a lot harder. But you know, there's the social cost too, and in terms of you know living in communities, like you want everyone to be sort of like thriving. It takes a real toll when folks aren't. And then there's also like the economic cost in terms of sort of like individuals in terms of like lost potential. But also like what we see in terms of our sort of like country as a whole, like poverty costs like our country anywhere from like 800 billion to over one trillion dollars, like every single year. That's not a one time thing. That's like a regular cost that we're like seeing all those dollars like represent like people, you know, who haven't been able to like go on and like do the schooling that they wanted to like have the safe housing that they want to grow up to like be the thing that they could actually be to like maybe actually change something else in the world or be a great artist or something like that you know, it takes a toll on us sort of like individually and collectively. But Sophie and actually some of our other colleagues at Columbia have done like some really, really interesting research that actually like makes some of those connections between like the individual and the like societal costs as well. Such a good point. And as Megan was saying, that child poverty costs the country a lot. What we did was took a look at what the broader social benefits would add up to if there was a more universal child allowance in the United States. And so it took all of the causal research on, of the effects of income on things like educational outcomes, health, parents' health, employment in adulthood, longevity, all of these different domains, reduced spending on child welfare, reduced spending on criminal justice, all of these different domains, and added them up to see what the broader social benefits would be of a fully refundable or universal child allowance in the U.S., and found that the benefits outweighed the direct cost by about eight to one. Right. So that's and that's lost, you know, benefits that we are kind of leaving behind when we don't have such policies in effect in this country. We'll definitely put that in the show notes, that study and other studies. We'll put a bunch of your studies in the in the show notes are so, so important. Sophie, let's stay with you for a second. The politics of the child tax credit are immense. And 
Consequently, it does some good things to reduce child poverty, but also fails to to really address child poverty. So can you tell us some of the pros and cons of the role the child tax credit plays in reducing child poverty in this country? No, it's a policy that's had this name, the child tax credit, but it's been very different over the course of its lifetime. So the CTC was originally a $400 credit for families with children. There was no way that you could receive any of it if you were low income. It was very much tied to your tax liability and it did nothing to reduce child, child poverty. We actually just ran these numbers and found that, you know, the reduction in child poverty associated with the initial credit was, I think, about 0%. Wow. Yeah. So in 2021, we saw what happens when they do receive it, right? And you see this full expansion of the CTC, full refundability, and just sharp reductions in child poverty and in food insecurity and in stress among families. And so we know what the gaps are. We know how to fill them and what those potential effects could be on child poverty and these other outcomes. But again, it's more of a a policy choice. Absolutely. Well, in your your reports, I think you all really coined the term children left behind. So who are they? So overall in 2022, 26% of children were left behind by the CTC, but you see notable disparities by race, ethnicity, Whereas much more than one in third or or over 40% of Black and Latino children are left behind by the CTC or not receiving the full credit. You also see children in rural areas disproportionately ineligible for the full credit. You see children with single parents. More than 60% of children with a single mom who's a female are left behind by the CTC. So just, it again, reinforces some already underlying inequities in terms of a gender pay gap affecting the wages between a single mom and a father who might be making more money because of gender pay gap. And that's just exacerbated then by the CTC because of its tie to earnings. And, you know, a big one that Megan shed an extreme amount of light on is the fact that children in larger families are disproportionately ineligible for the full CTC. And that's directly tied to the structure of the credit. Megan, yeah. Tell us about that. And also, you know, I know you guys have done work on sort of how it's also disproportionately negatively impacting youngest kids. So anything on that too, yeah. Yeah, no, I think like the name child tax credit sort of implies to anyone who might just hear it for the first time or isn't super familiar with it, like, oh, this must be something that's available to like all or at least most kids in the country. And it must be, you know, sort of like just very specifically like about kids. Mm -hmm. But in fact, (laughs) it's almost like has been like a a lot of like the opposite of that because we had such a like a complicated formula to like figure out how much your child tax credit would be. It turned out that in practical terms, it was actually requiring families to earn more money with each additional child in the family to keep maintaining access to the full credit. So what does that mean? Like in real terms, like it meant that. We already were saying that you basically needed about like $30,000 if you had one child to get the full child tax credit. When you had a second child in your family, you actually all of a sudden needed about $36,000 in order to just still get the full child tax credit, not get like more, but just still get the full one per child. If you had a third child, you needed to earn actually over $40,000 just to keep getting the full child tax credit. If you had four children, you actually needed to earn somewhere like between forty six dollars and $48,000, like getting close up to like $50,000 wow. just to maintain access for the full credit for each child and make sure that like your third or fourth child didn't lose out like compared to the to the first or second child in the family. I'm not sure that that was ever really like an intention, like on behalf of Congress, but it's what happens when you don't put children, like which First Focus talks about this all the time. And I learned so much of this, like from being there, like from Bruce, like all of your framing is what happens when you don't actually put children at the center of a policy that's meant to be about kids. They end up losing out, even if in ways that you probably never even would have expected. Because like, of course, I think anyone who has like common sense would say like, yeah, it doesn't really track that when you have more children, like you automatically have more money. Like it's usually But what we're actually saying with this child tax credit is like that's what we're actually saying. And so it's like an upside down like structure. Yeah. And that hurts all kids, right? And I think it's what happens when you're actually just like tying you know, children's access to a support that's meant to be about them to things that like they have no control, like children have no control over like 
what type of job their parents have, even when not their parents may be able to work, they might have health issues, they might have other caring issues, they might live in a place where there are no jobs. You know, they have no a- control over how much money their parents earn. They have no control over how many kids are in the family. They have no control over where they live, like all of these things. And so then why are you all of a sudden tying like children's access to a credit that's meant to be about them? So all of these like changeable family circumstances that kids actually have nothing like to do with. And at the end of the day, like you're hurting like the kids, because if say like using just the family size example, if you have three children in the family and the third child is all of a sudden getting less because the parents didn't meet that income threshold for that family size, you know, it's not like the family is going to just like not feed the third kid, (laughs) like the same amount of food as the other two. It means that every kid in the family like has to make do with less because you have to share the resources like equally among all your family members. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that what's awesome about what you guys have talked about here is that the focus, even on something called the child tax credit, is often about the deservingness of adults. <laughs> yes, yes. And and I love your frame, Megan, because your examples highlighted the difference between just having a general child focus, you know, and then centering children, right? And I think sometimes that distinction, while nuanced, is very important and very critical. Coming up after the break, Megan and Sophie detail the differences between the 2021 child tax credit and the new child tax credit on the Senate floor. All that and more ahead. Stick around. Making the world a better place for all children can seem like an impossibly huge task. Some of you may be thinking, I am just one person. What could I possibly do to make a difference? I'm Leila Nimatala, Vice President of Advocacy and Mobilization at First Focus on Children. And I'm inviting you to join us and become one of our volunteer advocates, whom we call our Ambassadors for Children. Ambassadors are our most active child advocates who raise critical issues with the U.S. Congress and with the administration related to child policy and funding decisions both for kids in the U.S. and worldwide. But don't take my word for it. We asked one of our ambassadors to share her experience. Hello, my name is Annette Bridges, also known as Dr. B, and I live in Louisville, Kentucky. The welfare of children and their families is a deep concern for me and really always has been, especially those from marginalized communities. I care about equity in education, resources, and health. And I'm not quite sure what it's going to take for our elected officials to invest in our children. And I mean fully invest in our children. It really boils down to the haves and have nots. It's a selfish attitude if an elected official does not consider children as a priority. I say selfish because if you think about it, other countries with less resources can provide universal preschool as an option for families then why is it that our country can't do that as well? I am proud to be an ambassador for First Focus on Children because they are serious about the work they have done, are doing, and will do in the near future. Their efforts are relentless. Think about being an ambassador for them, being a voice for the voiceless. I can't think of anything else more worthy. Thanks for listening, and it's been my pleasure to talk about what is near and dear to my heart. And that is children. Thank you for your time. So please join us, won't you? Check out campaignforchildren.org backslash ambassadors on how to become a first Focus on Children ambassador and to link up with our fabulous community of committed child advocates. First Focus on Children is a bipartisan advocacy organization dedicated to making children and families the priority in federal policy and budget decisions. First Focus on Children moves beyond individual issues to serve a more important role, child advocacy. We educate lawmakers and the American public about the issues facing children. To learn more about our work and ways you can become an ambassador, go to firstfocus.org. Coming up on our State of Play, 
Masalcha and I are going to chat about the amendments that are on the Senate floor and how they might create more barriers to eligibility for the child tax credit. What did both of you see, you know, when the American Rescue Plan Act, you know, which was passed in 2021, you know, what did that mean for kids across the country? Sophie, we can start with you. I mean, I think that it was a really amazing moment. Looking back, I don't want to say that there was a bit of stun, but like, oh my gosh, this is actually happening. And I I, like that was a policy that was passed in the United States where it always seemed like, oh, will this, could this ever happen? Do you think this would ever actually make it? And once we, you know, learned about the, the policy and the proposal and what would happen, we immediately tried to understand what its effects would be on both poverty and other several other indicators of child well-being and family well-being. Um, So at the time, the center was producing monthly poverty rates, where during COVID, we saw such fluctuations in income from month to month because of different policy changes. You don't see those fluctuations as much when you're looking at an annual poverty rate because all that income is just totaled up and held against an annual poverty threshold. So you don't see how actually it can be somewhat destabilizing when you're getting, you know, $600 a month in unemployment and then all of a sudden that's completely pulled back. So that inspired this development of a monthly, more real-time poverty measure that could track the effects of different COVID-related policies. And, you know, when we heard about the the ARP expansion immediately started gearing up to understand what its effects would be on on the monthly poverty rate and found that in the first month it was introduced, uh, you know, close to 4 million children were moved above the poverty line just in that month of of introduction. And you saw significant reductions in, in the monthly child poverty rate. And then, you know, as you also probably expect, with the rollback of the credit in, in the January of 2022, we saw a sharp increase in child poverty immediately. So that was what we saw in terms of poverty. And then, you know, in September, when the annual poverty rates came out, you saw how that all aggregated up to see this historic reduction in the child poverty rate in 2021 as a result of the credit. And then in 2022, the historic increase in child poverty as it was rolled back. Yeah, I think like I would just add, it was a really cool time to be a researcher actually <laughs> looking at this policy because it was a transformational, you know, thing that we could see on paper. But then obviously, like, you know, our colleagues at Columbia, like very quickly, like tried to get ready to understand the effects. But you actually saw researchers like across the country, almost like mobilizing, like simultaneously to say, like, let's like track this and like see what's actually happening. And they really like met the moment in terms of also trying to, you know, not sort of like let this happen and sort of fade away, but actually develop such a strong evidence base that yes, even though it did expire, this issue has not fallen off the radar. Bruce, like you've seen so many policy debates over the years and so many things. And it's like, it's hard to like sometimes get folks to like keep their focus like on an issue like after you know the a certain like policy window closes or something like that and i feel like you know the fact that we actually have so much rich information on like what exactly this did and actually that it was a real game changer for families has been so valuable to actually like keeping the drumbeat up for you know getting some sort of like reinstatement of this you know one day full expansion. I do believe like one day it will be back like in its full piece. But even like in terms of the debate now, we wouldn't have that if we didn't have all of that evidence to actually really show like what it did. I think one of the things you guys have really highlighted here is that every aspect of the lives of kids and families were really affected by this. And and so just in this array of things that are important to kids from their education and their health to their hunger and housing and, you know, just child welfare, engagement, all of that stuff. So it really is important, but unfortunately expired, as you all pointed out. And so now we're at a moment where Congress is considering something where it would be a step. So it wouldn't get all the way back to where we were in 2021, but it is a step. And so that legislation is H.R. 7024, the Tax Relief for American Families and Workers Act. Um, This bill passed the House um, by an amazing 357 to 70 vote total. And so we were really hopeful that it would move quickly in the Senate, but it has not. And so, you know, this bill takes some steps. It doesn't get us back to where we were, but we're worried that there'll be attempts to even roll it back, some aspects of it. So I know you guys have looked at this legislation. And so can you talk a little bit about how it would um, improve the child tax credit, the three or four changes it makes and why they're important to kids? 
the bill that's coming up soon, it is a step like back towards, you know, what we had in 2021, but it is definitely obviously not a full reinstatement of the expansion. And it's one of those things where I think it's, you know, two things can be true at once in that, like, it's really good, especially taken in the context of how we've expanded the child tax credit incrementally over time. It's great that the focus in this particular policy change is on the children who have been historically like left out of the full credit. Yep. You know, when we've made changes to the child tax credit in, in different years, it has not always been, you know, the focus of trying to close that gap. So really commendable piece of the legislation is that it does focus on those children who like deserve to have access to the full credit. It's also true at the same time in that it doesn't reinstate like the 2021 thing. So it doesn't, you know, automatically like include those kids fully. But that's not a reason for like action, you know, sort of like not to be taken now. I think what it does in terms of the practical pieces is it changes really in a positive way that child penalty that I actually really like that phrase first, like I might use it now, like um, in that, you know, we were disadvantaging children who had, you know, siblings. Basically, once you started to have like at least a two child family, your family was sort of losing out because you were asked to like earn more money to like keep access to the credit. So it gets rid of that disadvantaging and makes it a much more true like per child benefit and that we're not moving the goalposts on families like every time their family size changes. It does that through a very technical sort of like formula change, but in the practical terms, it means that if you have one, two, three, four children, it doesn't matter, you can still earn the same amount of money to get the full credit for your family. And then over time, it actually adjusts the credit for inflation, which is like hugely important. Sophie and a couple of colleagues at Columbia have shown that actually when you don't pay attention to that type of very technical thing, you're actually like, you know, the credit gets much less effective over time because it's just worth less like in real terms to, to families. And it also means that like the anti-poverty potential really loses out over time because it's not able to keep up with actually like the needs that families are continue to have. And it also has a provision, which some is called the look back provision, which actually just really is, again, trying to address the fact that the families who have been historically left out of this credit haven't met like whatever sort of like very high like income requirements that we've had in different years. But also when you are thinking about real situations of families, sometimes the reason you're not actually you know, qualifying with the same amount of earnings is because you've had like different disruptions like or changes in your family's like life. And so what the look back provision is, which has actually been something that's been a very common policy element that has been used in a bunch of other different tax provisions over times, both for families and for actually like businesses and things, because it shows that like in any given year, like something can happen that disrupts like your sort of like status quo. And it lets you actually just use like the prior year's income if that happened to be higher. And if that happens to then enable you to qualify for higher credit. What that means in like real terms for families, it means like if you had a child and you're all of a sudden out of the labor force for part or all of the year, your earnings when you go to file your tax return that year are going to be lower. But guess what? You actually have another like family member who you need to support, which again, if a child tax credit was actually like centering children, wouldn't be a problem. But because we tie everything to income here, it all of a sudden becomes problematic that you lost like your earnings for the very like worthy cause of like welcoming a beautiful baby. A look back provision can really help in this situation because you can say actually the year before when I was like fully in the labor market, I can actually just count that income and make sure that my new baby like has the child tax credit for their expenses. Yeah. A lot of folks have like income volatility. Like if you're working like shift work or you have no control really over the hours that you're able to have or maybe something was disrupted in your sector and you know or you had to switch from full-time to part-time because you have caring responsibilities or anything like that a look back provision in very real terms like these are the types of situations where it can really help yeah. all of these pieces come together to do a lot of like this bill is very technical changes like it doesn't give you the good headlines that like 2021 did which is basically like we're actually now including like almost all kids in this credit this, you know, is much more of a sort of behind the scenes, like folks who are in the weeds, like we can make these changes to actually include more kids. But it's still in very real terms, like does make a difference for the families that it would benefit. But we do have to, I think, like keep our eye on the prize of like this is moving us towards what we had in 2021. It's not getting us all the way back there yet. But like we are at least like 
moving back in the right direction. Yeah, absolutely. Well, as, as you say, it's like at least we're stopping the penalization of people or penalizing children for mm -hmm. the fact that their parents have a baby or there's a natural disaster or their parents have to do caregiving for even them or their, you know, their grandparents mm -hmm. or any of those kinds of things like loss of a job. So it just fundamentally to me, the child, that's the one thing about the child tax credit. It's really never made sense. It almost penalizes when you have hardship, like that's when you need things the most. Yeah. And I really encourage people to to look at these resources. Um, in our show notes, we'll post the reports by the center on everything from, you know, the the cost benefit of reducing child poverty to y'all's amazing studies on the children left behind, right? Because the parents make too little, right? So sort of the irony there of of how that this policy mm -hmm. works. But then also the work you guys did around how once the child tax credit was made fully refundable, the benefits, and then when it went away, how then we, you know, saw a spike in child poverty again. So mm -hmm. all of that will be in our show notes, and I really encourage people to use those resources. But I'll turn it over to S Sally to ask you a, a final question. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, again, Megan and Sophie, thank you so much for the work you do. You know, as Megan probably is really familiar, our theory of change really starts with raising awareness and the research you do and the reports you push out are critical. And, you know, I'm sure for you, especially, I know for us, it gets frustrating when the research is there and it's very obvious what we should do. And Congress and policy kind of does a U-turn or a pivot that you just kind of have to scratch your head. In those moments, sometimes we turn to music uh, <laughs> as like a little pick-me-up. And so are there any, you know, albums, songs, artists that you really go to when you're just having a, a bad day or you see a headline that makes you go, huh? <laughs> Which happens a lot these days. Right. <laughs> Sophie, I'll let you go first. When I'm like need a bit of a, a pick me up, I often listen to Prince. <laughs> so <laughs> which awesome. it's less about the maybe the message, but more just like get some energy back for me to kind of, okay, what can we do now? So mm -hmm. I would say uh, Prince Uptown would be a, a song. Oh, that awesome. Helps nice. Time. Nice. Yeah. 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 We like that. Yeah. <laughs> when I was thinking about this question, it can go in a lot of different directions because I think I have like very random music like selection if anyone looked at my Spotify. <laughs> but because you can see like a lot of Irish music and then also a lot of like late 90s early 2000s like <laughs> hip hop and all those things. So it's like none of them all go together. But Sometimes, like, if I've needed, like, one song to, like, just, like, okay, I need a little energy boost. It's actually, like, Tom Petty's American Girl has, like, just yeah, a really good, mm -hmm. like, start to it that I think you can't, like, mm -hmm. not be, like, energized. Yeah. A little oh, bit. I awesome. love these. Mm -hmm. I yeah, love these, these are awesome <laughs> ads. Thank you, guys. <laughs> love it. Thank you, guys, both so much. We really appreciate your time. Thank you for having us. Thanks so much for everything that First Focus always does. I'm very proud of them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, Bruce, this is all moving very quickly. Let's unpack this and help our listeners really understand what's happening here with this new version of the child tax credit. We all know that this passed the House 357 to 70, an overwhelming majority, in your opinion, when you look at things, shouldn't this pass rather quickly in the Senate? Yeah, you would think so. In the House, it passed by something like an eight to one margin among Democrats and a four to one margin among Republicans. So it had bipartisan support. And yet, as it moves over to the Senate, um, we really are getting into these notions of uh, deservedness of adults. And the conversation is rapidly moving away from what are the needs of children? And, you know, we're pointing out, of course, that the child tax credit is about children. It is in the name inherently. And so why why are we moving toward this conversation? We also know that reducing child poverty is really important. And the benefits of the, the bill is that it does help 16 million low-income kids to some extent. And, and, you know, as we talked earlier, both Sophie and Megan talked about it, it's not perfect. It's far from it doesn't even get into uh, getting all children a base set amount of money. So it still leaves some poor kids behind. But it does make progress. It is It does provide an important step 
toward improving the way the child tax credit treats low-income kids. So, you know, we talked a lot about this first year of life and just how stressful that can be for families, especially financially. What does the bill do to address this need for families? Yeah, it does a couple of things. I mean, as we both talked about, like, we should actually be providing you know, additional assistance, not less assistance, but at the very least, like, let's not penalize families because their income drops. And that's unfortunately what happens with the current child tax credit. So what the bill does, it does a couple of things. One is the bill has this thing called a look back provision. And what it does is say, if your income dropped in a calendar year, you can look back to the prior year where you may not have had a disruption in your income And you can use that so that your income doesn't drop and therefore your child tax credit doesn't drop. So that would be very beneficial to families who are having kids, but it's also beneficial to families who live through a natural disaster or there's a sickness in the family, someone getting cancer, or you have to stop working to provide caregiving to your kids or your parents or some other family member. So for a lot of reasons, this is actually a great policy, but it particularly speaks to families who are having children. Because we know there's evidence that shows that actually the income for a woman will drop about on average 40%, you know, during this period of time. So we shouldn't penalize those families for having kids. Because the issue really is with the bill, and we're trying to address this, and we highlighted this earlier, if you make less, you will also receive less. That's right. So this bill at least says you should be able to maintain, you know, Uh, that level of benefit that you were getting in the prior year. And then the second provision that the bill does that I think is really important, the example I would give is that let's say there's a a single mom who makes $100,000 a year and has three kids. Under current law, she would get $6,000. She would get $2,000 per child. The problem with the child tax credit as is, is let's say say a single mom with three kids, it makes $10,000 she would only get $1,125 for the first child and nothing for the second and third child. And so one of the things the bill does is get rid of the child penalty. So we would say that that family should get at least $2,000 per child, but at least what the bill does is say you should get rid of the penalty and so that you get at least the $1,125 per child. So in that case, the child tax credit benefit to that family would go from $1,125 to $3,375. So still not equity. They're not, still not getting the 6000 but at least it's much better than under current law. Right. Because we know that that's really impacting the whole family, right? It's not just impacting her third child. That's exactly right. Like as you said earlier, you don't just uh, allocate a budget to your first child and leave the other ones behind. And and that's what's that's what's sort of ludicrous about the current child tax credit policy. And thus, it's one of the good things about this bill is it does get rid of this child penalty. Right. And we know, you know, like we've outlined and Megan and and Sophie have really done a great job of laying out this isn't a home run by any stretch, especially when compared to the advances and the real success that we saw in 2021. But what do you think will happen with this bill in the Senate? So you would think it would be a slam dunk, right? I mean, it passed, you know, by a more than five to one margin overall in the House. And so now it's coming over to the Senate. And yet there's some talk of offering amendments that would really weaken the bill. And so under the House bill, $33 $33 billion would be going to families from that legislation over the time period through 2025. So that's enormous benefit to families. And so there, therefore, you know, we believe it's an important step toward addressing some of these inequities. It's still like, again, it doesn't get to where we really want, which is what we had in 2021, but it's an improvement. Unfortunately, there's some people in the Senate who are talking about offering amendments. And so talked about like one thing would be to get rid of the look back. And their argument is, is that, you know, they talk about work incentives and all this kind of stuff. Well, it's ludicrous to think that people would quit working because they might get $900 or something. It's just ridiculous. And yet that's what they're, they're trying to do. And what we would point out is you, again, are harming people most in need. You're harming people. The look back helps families having babies. It helps families dealing with 
you know, a healthcare disaster or a crisis like cancer. It helps families living through a natural disaster, caregiving, all kinds of reasons why people have fluctuations in their income. They they could get lose their job for whatever reason. So this is really beneficial to them. And and most importantly, it's it's to the child. Like that's where we really want the focus to be. And so anyway, there's a suggestion that they want to get rid of the look back provision. The Heritage Foundation and others have written a paper encouraging that, that and we would oppose that. Another thing would be to get rid of the language that eliminates the child penalty. So for some reason, it appears that there's some senators that really like the idea of a child penalty. We, of course, do not. So they're talking about striking that. And then there's also a suggestion that someone might offer an amendment to impose a citizenship requirement. So right now, there already is for children. You have to have a social security number as a child to get the child tax credit. This would say that even if you have an immigrant in your household, you could not get the child tax credit. So we know that one quarter of the nation's children live in immigrant households. And if you eliminate that, you're going to create a massive disparities between U.S. citizen children. And that is unfair and uncalled for and harmful to kids. So you're penalizing children because one of their family members is an immigrant. That's unfair and uncalled for. It's actually really dumb in the long term, too, because these kids are our future. And so why would you shortchange them and ensure that they're going to be less productive citizens like that just makes no sense at all? That's what I was about to say, actually, that, you know, yes, it's it's hurting the children, but it's also hurting the country long term. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We really should be valuing all our children. And yet here we are in the child tax credit and we're about to have a debate where people, because of their imposition of deservedness standards and and perceptions on adults, are going to create massive disparities among children and, and valuing some children more than other children. And and we just, you know, as an organization, we just think that that's unacceptable. This is Speaking of Kids. Thanks for listening. I'm Bruce Leslie. And I'm Masela Luby. Special thanks to our guests, Megan Curran and Sophie Collier. Speaking of Kids is a podcast by First Focus on Children. Elizabeth Windham is the supervising producer, and Julia Windham is the associate producer. Layla Nimitala is the advocacy and mobilization producer, and the senior producer is Jay Woodward. Our theme music is Don't Look Twice by Sam Barsh. For more information about this week's episode, go to firstfocus.org. You can find all of our links in the show notes. If you have any thoughts, questions, or interest in becoming a First Focus on Children ambassador, email us at speakingofkids at firstfocus.org. And please follow, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. That would be very helpful to us. Speaking of Kids is produced by Winhaven Productions and Blue Jay Atlantic.